my privilege to speak with Bob Metcalf. He is the Professor of Innovation at University of Texas at Austin and the founder and inventor of Ethernet. And we're celebrating the 40th anniversary of On May 22nd is the 40th birthday. That's incredible. Um, tell us how you invented Ethernet. I mean, how does that something like that that's so ubiquitous come about? Wow, you jumped to the you jumped to the heart of the matter. <laughs> I'm an engineer. I'm interested. Well, in short, in a building in 1973, we decided that we we're going to fill the building with personal computers, and we were going to build a big laser printer to print uh, bitmap any font you wanted. And I was the networking guy, so my great fortune was to be given a problem that no one had ever had before connecting a building full of personal computers. Of course, it's hard to convince people that was such a big event because, of course, all the buildings are full of personal computers today. But in then, in 1973, that was a new problem. That's incredible. So what was the first step you took? I took steps long before that date uh, in building the early internet, uh, which we called the ARPANET in those days, a packet switching network. And the goal of the Ethernet was to extend the packet switching infrastructure into the buildings to reach every desk. Was there a team that you worked with? Did you sit down with a group of engineers and say, how are we going to solve this problem? All of those things. <laughs> I had been a networking person and then came to Xerox, so then the, when the, this networking problem cropped up, it was given to me. In fact, there was somebody already working on it, a man named Charles Simony, and he was working on a network he called Signet, Simony's Infinitely Glorious Network. Anyway, so uh, first thing I did was buy a spool of cable. Uh, a mile long piece of coax and I started putting electrical pulses in one end just to see what would happen and you know they come out the other end <laughs> and they're a little misshapen uh, worse for the journey but while I was doing that getting back to your question a young grad student across the way noticed I wasn't very good at um, soldering and skinning the cable and he was so he, and his name was David Boggs so he helped me with that initial experiment and then we worked for the next few years together uh, building the first Ethernet. At what point did Ethernet start evolving and becoming a standard as opposed to what you did for your uh, PC network? It started in February of 1979, quite a bit later, when I went to become, I left Xerox to become a consultant for Digital Equipment Corporation, which was at the time the number two computer company in the world, and its vice president of engineering, Gordon Bell, asked me to invent another local area network because ah. uh, he liked Ethernet. And I said, well, A, um, I really feel uncomfortable about doing that since I just left Xerox. And, and two is I've already designed the best one I know how. <laughs> so if I did a different one for you, it would be worse. <laughs> so we convinced DEC and Xerox to begin cooperating to develop something they could use to interconnect their products. IEEE comes in here in just a minute. And so here I have DEC and Xerox and then Intel all discussing how to build this network they were going to use. And someone said, wait a minute, these are dangerous meetings. These are major U.S. corporations conspiring yeah. in restraint of trade. So maybe we should avoid uh, getting prosecuted. Why don't we make it an open standard? And how would we do that? Well, we'd create a project at uh, IEEE and give our standard to the IEEE, and then the IEEE project would make it a standard. And it's continued to evolve uh, uh, the standard over the years. Well, well, that's, a, that's an understatement. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the Ethernet has been invented and reinvented many, many times, and the standard has been evolving. But one of, the, one of the disciplines on that evolution has been a high degree of backward compatibility, and that, that has made a big difference in uh, the effective proliferation of Ethernet, because every time they come up with a new version of it, it's highly inter interconnectable with the old versions. It would have to be. Could you imagine the cost if it weren't? And people wouldn't move to a new version if things didn't continue to work. Well, they were already reluctant to move to a faster <laughs> version, but we, um, so that's an important part. So there have been many, many inventors of Ethernet, many of whom are annoyed at me for getting all the credit. <laughs> and I immediately want to acknowledge all of their contributions, and I'm really sorry that I get all the credit. <laughs> but life is hard. That's the way it goes. <laughs> oh. And by 19, I, my joke is that by 1982, there were people buying Ethernet who I didn't know personally. And by 1985, there were people inventing Ethernet, whom I didn't know personally. And, and uh, some of them are still annoyed. How do you think Ethernet, or whatever its um, subsequent incarnations, what do you think they're going to look like 40 years from now? Well, 40 years is kind of hard to do. Um, but the, uh, 
the general idea behind Ethernet is going in many directions, quite surprisingly to me, and there are many people in, other than me inventing these directions. So you see Ethernet going faster and faster and faster. So now we're up to 100 gigabits per second, and the next thing up there is a terabit per second. And we started way down here at 2.94 megabits per second. So there's been a lot of progress in speed. So that's one of the directions Ethernet's going. Another direction is it's gone wireless. So now we have Wi-Fi, which uh, began life as wireless Ethernet, which is a little ironic, by the way, because when Ethernet was invented 40 years ago, it was based on a wireless packet radio network at the University oh, of I Hawaii, wow. the wow. Aloha network. But then we, to go the speeds we needed to go, we couldn't use radio, so we went to coax and twisted pair and all of But now with Wi-Fi, 40 years later, we're basically back to the Aloha network again back in 1970. That's really interesting. I bet most people don't realize that. And another direction Ethernet is going is down. So we've networked uh, workstations and mainframes and mini computers and PCs. And we've gone now, of course, to cell phones. But we're going way below that now to embedded microprocessors. And there's about 10 billion of those shipped every year. And very few of them are networked. And there's another direction that Ethernet's going, which, another surprising one, which is what developed over time was uh, a lot of bandwidth in the local area network because Ethernet got really fast quickly, mm -hmm. and then a lot of bandwidth in the long haul network because of the development of dense wave division multiplexing. But there was a chasm between them because the carriers providing service were using T1 and, oh, yeah, yeah. and dial up and old modem. So another place Ethernet is going rapidly now is to bridge that telechasm, as it was called, telechasm. And, <laughs> and provide uh, packet-based gigabit class services using Ethernet between the carriers and, the, and their customers. Fantastic. Um, any words of wisdom for the next generation of engineers coming along? Well, to, to learn from the Ethernet as an innovation case, bunch of lessons to learn. And, and by the way, at our birthday party on May 22nd, we hope to explore these at length. That is, what lessons can we learn about innovation from the successful innovation of Ethernet? And one of them involves the IEEE. That is core to the Ethernet idea is the idea of a de jure standard developed mm -hmm. by engineers. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that has, that was the secret of Ethernet's success is that we, we had that idea. I'm very grateful to Project 802 so there's a lot of talk about energy and sustainability and low power usage, and I understand you've been talking a lot about energy. So what does energy mean to the Ethernet, or vice versa? Well, there's a, f a funny story, which is in the early days of Ethernet, I'm now peddling it with this half-inch coax, and people said, Bob, no one is ever going to string new wires for your damn invention. <laughs> You've got to learn to put your invention on the power line, which the power line goes everywhere already. Yeah. So you got to put Ethernet on power line, which we tried to do, and it did not work. Power line is a horrible transmission medium. And we failed, actually, to do it. So now, 40 years later, there's a new standard called power over Ethernet. So now I get to say to the power people, no one's going to string new wires for your <laughs> electricity. You've got to learn to carry electricity on the Ethernet cables. And that's, that's what's happening, power over Ethernet. But in terms of uh, grand technological sweeps, you might, think, you might say that with pretty much degree, uh, to a very high degree, we have solved bandwidth. We're not done yet, but the Internet has pretty much made bandwidth abundantly cheap and available. Mm -hmm. But we have other problems now. And this might be of interest to young engineers. Uh, another set of problems relate to energy. And the, uh, we need to solve those. We need to make energy as uh, abundant as we have bandwidth, cheap and clean energy. Yeah. Yeah. So we need to uh, be working. And I've been, I, I've been investing in energy for a few years now. I've, I'm sort of winding that down, but for about 10 years invested in energy. And the only way I achieved any standing in that field was I, I took the learnings from the internet experience and applied them to predictions about how we were going to solve energy. One, and the very first observation you make is that cons you begin by conserving, but you don't end up there. No. people aren't likely to conserve. Yeah, do we use less bandwidth now than we did before we built the internet? 
I use at least 10 times as much. <laughs> I think the world uses a million times as much. So when we're done solving energy, are we going to have less energy because we've all conserved and we're all wearing sweaters and all that? No. no. <laughs> when we're no. done solving energy, it will be squanderably abundant, cheap and clean, just like uh, internet bandwidth. Sounds great. Well, is there any last words that you have? Want to share some wisdom about ethernet, something we haven't talked about yet? Ethernet is a great example of engineering working out. And so I'd, I'd urge people, as I am, is to look at it for lessons on how to solve our, new, our remaining problems. We have help, energy, health care, education. Yeah. And uh, I think there's a lot to learn from how this, this hundreds of people, thousands, millions of people who have been involved in inventing Ethernet and, and uh, managing its evolution over time. Many of those learnings, I think, can be successfully applied to solving these other problems. And I encourage young engineers to do that. That sounds great. You are a total inspiration to all of us, and this has been an absolute pleasure, and I really appreciate your time. Thanks for asking. Thanks, Bob.